Today we look at the baptism of Jesus by his cousin, John the Baptist. It is a familiar story. Jesus is baptized and as he comes out of the water, a dove descends upon him and the voice of God is heard saying, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. It was, this event was spoken about in the Old Testament. It was a fulfillment of prophecy, but it begs the question, why did Jesus need to be baptized? John the Baptist was going around the countryside calling people to repentance for the forgiveness of their sins. But then Jesus came seeking baptism. We know that he was without sin, so he had nothing to repent from, nothing to be forgiven for. For us, baptism is the symbolic ending of our life in sin and the entering into the new life with Christ. Cleansed, forgiven, now claimed fully as the sons and daughters of the Most High, living in the light and in righteousness, living in grace and freedom. For Jesus, his baptism signified the beginning of his work to teach us and to redeem us. As with all that he would be doing during his ministry, he was modeling baptism as something that all believers needed to do, a step in our faith journey. Baptism is not just a cleansing of our sins and a point of redemption for us, but it also serves as a point for us to look to Jesus and follow, living lives that emulate the life that Jesus lived, one of sacrifice done for the redemption and healing of all people. Also with Jesus' baptism, we have the spirit descending upon him. This was a sign that his ministry was now empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we have God declaring that this was a son with whom he was well pleased. In this one small passage, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit together. Jesus' baptism is a beautiful portrayal of the loving union of the Trinity. It is in this moment that Jesus is marked for the beginning of his ministry in which he would partake of the human experience fully as the spotless lamb of God sent to save the world. The gospels don't exactly explain to us why Jesus needed to be baptized other than for righteousness sake. It is interesting to think about how all of it connects, the birth in a stable, a baptism, a life of ministry in which he faced many hardships and temptations, living simply, healing the sick, caring for the poor, and then his ultimate sacrifice upon the cross. Each a necessary step for God to bridge the distance between God's self and humankind, a way to embrace us in a way we could see and understand. And yet even for the disciples who were with him throughout his ministry, the point was sometimes lost on them. Near the close of Jesus' ministry, James and John asked to be seated next to Jesus in the life to come. How much of that do we see in politics today? People vying to be near the person of power for their own glorification or to help them in their own reach for power. For them, power and glory are the most important thing. It is not what public service is supposed to be about, but it seems for many, this is what it has come to be. For the brothers, James and John, this seems to be their desire to sit next to the one with the power and the glory for all eternity. Yet Jesus responds that the baptism in which I was baptized, you will be baptized. What they don't understand just then was that the baptism that Jesus entered into was one of selfless sacrifice, the continual outpouring of himself upon a hurting people continually facing persecution, rejection, and ultimately a painful death. This is what they were called to do. Think of the rich young ruler who says he wants to serve Jesus. When Jesus says to him to go and sell all that he has, the young ruler sadly goes away for he is very wealthy. He cannot make the sacrifice that Jesus is requesting of him. Jesus doesn't love this young man any less, but I'm sure he felt aggrieved that this man thought more of his earthly wealth than the heavenly wealth he would obtain. And not only that, the joy that comes with serving the Lord. Jesus' spirit-filled ministry began with his baptism. 
In that joining with us, we see how he entered into the suffering of the least of these, his children. He cared for the prostitute who was about to be stoned, the lepers, the death of the officer's child. He spoke against the government that did not help the poor and the disenfranchised. He spoke against the Pharisees and Sadducees who took advantage of the uneducated Jews who were just trying to live lives of faithfulness. Whether it was political people or religious people, it didn't matter. If they weren't caring for those in their charge, Jesus spoke out against them. He spoke up for justice as he, as he showed us the way of working toward bringing the kingdom of God to earth. He did so in a way that saved a lot of people, but offended many in power. We know the torture he went through in the end to save us from our sin. For James and John to sit with Jesus, they needed to enter into his baptism, just as we need to enter into his baptism as well. A couple of years ago, the PCUSA began the Matthew 25 initiative. This initiative is based on the parable of the goats and the sheep. You all remember the story, I'm sure. They get to heaven and God praises the sheep for being good and faithful stewards. He tells them that when he was in prison, they visited him. When he was hungry, they fed him. When he was a stranger, they welcomed him. They said they had never seen him before. And he replies that when we do this to the least of these, we do it to him, and likewise the goats who never cared for him. The Matthew 25 initiative seeks to involve congregations in three areas, anti-racism, systemic poverty, and vital congregations. Because if you have a vital congregation, a, a congregation committed to living out their baptism, their faith, then working to end injustices um, for ending injustices and ending systems of uh, and attitudes of racism and poverty, um, to work toward equitable opportunities that should be what we are striving for so that all can live the lives that God intended. This week, we saw the horrendous actions of an organized mob, domestic terrorists wreak havoc on our nation's capital. An officer was murdered white supremacists running rampant, an angry, hate-filled group of people. Some have said that underneath the hate is fear. Fear that their way of life is slipping past them with shifting demographics of people of color becoming the dominant group. What are these people afraid of? The loss of an ideal, of a dream, of power, a threat that somehow their way of life is at risk. What disturbs me even more are the Christian nationalists, those that adhere to the USA being a Christian only country, a white dominant country blessed and ordained by God, and that their way of interpreting the scripture is the only way. For what dis disturbs me the most is that so many political and religious leaders of this way take scripture out of context to justify their actions. I have been disturbed by non-believers saying such awful things about Christians on social media as if we all approve of the inhumane treatment of those who are different than ourselves. That we see people of color of the LGBT community of the disabled people of being less than. That we adhere to the belief that God has blessed our country and our whiteness above all other countries and all other people. Unfortunately for those non-believers, they don't know that true Christianity, the faith of the one true God calls us to love one another, regardless of who the other may be, that we are all created in the likeness of God, regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of whether we are rich or poor, educated or uneducated. They don't see that love for all, for all in Christian nationalists, but it is precisely that ability to love, to forgive, to show grace and mercy, to accept, to uphold and respect that makes true believers of God different. It is in this love that we radiate um, Christ, that we should be radi radiating that love of Christ and we need to be radiating 
that love of Christ, especially now in this time of darkness in our country. Our baptism calls us to loving action. I would like to end with this from Roger Gensch. Abraham Lincoln attended the church I served in Washington, DC, the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. His memory is revered there as it is by many throughout the nation. At this moment of dire political turbulence in our country that threatens to erode democracy itself, I find myself recalling Lincoln's healing words during an earlier moment of turmoil in the nation's history as he delivered his second inaugural address. With malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds. God gives us, th this admonition is as powerful today as it was in the troubled era in which Lincoln spoke. Indeed, it resonates profoundly with Jesus' own admonition to the disciples in the Sermon of the Mount, to love our enemies. And today there may be no doubt that our perceived enemies have become those who stand on one side or the other of the nation's political divide, a divide represented in most of our churches, our denomination as a whole, and in the communities in which we live. The admonition to love our enemies is surely one of the hardest things Jesus ever asked us to do. But he also specified the reason we are to try by the power of God's spirit to work within us quite simply because God is like that. And we are God's children who are to reflect that family resemblance in this world. We are to love our enemies so that we may be, even become children of our heavenly parent. Or as the CEB translation puts it, so that we will be acting like children are of our heavenly parent. Otherwise our witness is not distinctive. We are not salt and light in the, this world, but just blending. In short, loving our enemies goes to the heart of Christian witness, an expression of our identity as children of God. Theologian Miroslav Volf, who has thought long and hard about this challenge, articulates what it entails this way in his book, A Public Faith, writing that Christ follows, followers must love their enemies no less than they love themselves. Love doesn't mean agreement and approval. It means benevolence and beneficence, possible disagreement and disapproval notwithstanding. A combination of moral clarity that does not shy away from calling evil by its proper name and of deep compassion towards evildoers that is willing to sacrifice one's own life on their behalf was one of the extraordinary, extraordinary features of early Christianity. It should also be the central char characteristic of contemporary Christianity. Loving, loving our enemies does not absolve us to deter us from pursuing justice as we understand it, from our calling to stand in solidarity with the marginalized among us, or from calling evil by its name. Justice and mercy go together, both are works of God. And the mercifully just God calls us to both as we endeavor to bind up our nation wounds and grow into our full stature as God's children. Now more than ever, we need to love, love our enemies, to be faithful servants working at binding up the nation's wounds for the glory of God, to be that beacon of light upon the hill. As this famous song states, they will know we are Christians by our love. We are called to be different to live, live differently. We are called to wear the cloth of righteousness and to give witness through our love. So I urge you to make that commitment to live out your baptism in love and light with mercy and grace each and every day so that we can be an example of the love and grace that is given by the one true God, Christians whose lives reflect the true, true nature of God, whose lives make others want to know this God of love and truth and grace. Amen.